On that note, Carl, thank you very much. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wapner, front and center this hour, the return of the bull market, at least technically. But is it really back? We'll debate that with the Investment Committee of the S&P 500, now 20% off the October lows. Joining me for the hour today, Joe Terranova, Stephanie Link, Bill Baruch, and Capital Wealth Planning's Kevin Simpson is with us for the hour today as well. Let's check the markets. We do have fresh highs of the year, at least we did earlier. But as you can see, as Carl was just saying, we did back off 4,300. We're going for the first close above that level since August. So we did exit the longest Joe technical bear market since 1948. So technically, we say, OK, we're in a new bull market. But are we really? Well, it's a milestone and it's technically driven. So you asked why I will not say it's fundamentally driven and the bond market is not confirming it. So there's this divergence between what we're seeing reflected in the equity market and what we're seeing in the bond market. The bond market yields have backed up, Scott, and they've stayed there. Now, I understand Australia, Canada has raised interest rates, but think of where we were for a two year just in early May. We're, we're basically 100 basis points higher. And if you look at a 10 year, you're up about 75 basis points. So we're void of significant <clears throat> growth. That's for sure. We're still in an earnings recession. So we still in a, oh, so what you're telling me is you're not convinced we're actually in a bull market. Well, I'm giving you the reasons why. Yeah, I you know. Can, you're taking you a long only, time to get to my answer, You right? could only validate. You could only say this that. This is a yes a, or no question. No, but, no, but you have to understand why. You have to understand why it's just concentrated to the technicals. The fundamentals are not confirming it. So I'll say this to you. It's a nice milestone. That's it. Okay. That's all it is. All right. So, Steph. Um, the question over the last couple of days is, are the bulls in charge again, mm -hmm. or do the bears still have control of this market? Mm -hmm. How would you answer that question? Well, there's parts of the market that are in a bull market, right? Techno technology, comm services, discretionary, the, the SMH is up 45 percent. That's definitely bull market stuff, right? That's positive. The rest of the market is, is struggling. And that's what we've been talking about all year. That's been the biggest surprise of how narrow the market is, has been. But when you add up comm services and technologies, 35 percent of the, the, the S&P 500. So it's material. It's gotten us to where we are in the market overall. But I think because the economy is actually doing a little bit better, I think eventually we are going to see a broadening out and the laggards will catch up especially if we are, as I keep saying, the ninth inning with the Fed. Inflation is coming down and earnings have actually held in, not as bad as expected. So I think you are going to see a broadening. Does that lead us into a huge bull market? I don't I don't know, because there is alternatives out there right now in the fixed income arena as well as internationally. So I hear a no. I hear a no. Like a maybe. Like a yeah, maybe. I know, but that's, that doesn't work. That with doesn't work. A, yeah, but it's parts. It's parts that of the market. Yeah, I know, but especially on a Friday, it doesn't work either. <laughs> it's fun sitting here and talking about whether it's a bull market or a, or a bear market still. But but do you really want to be buying stocks and really loading into stocks when it's finally officially a bull market? And for for us, it's it's looking back at, at March. At the end of March, we started seeing these divergences, and our theme was bring out your 2019 playbook, and tech is going to lead us out of this hole. So for us, in, in our positioning and our mindset, it's been a bull market. What what happened? from last week was the Russell 2000 is up about six six and a half percent since then you're getting the breath you're getting other parts of this market to start to join and the Russell 2000 really broke out of that hole and for us that's turns on the green light for some of the other portions of the market we've begun rotating a bit still though I'm watching very closely. I trade the futures as well. The S&P futures, 4,300 to 4,330. We need to close above there on a weekly basis. We have not done that yet. All right. So, Kevin Simpson, it's great to have you here uh, for the hour. You're a pretty active trader. So you bring good perspective, um, good tactical perspective, too. How would you answer the question? Savita Subramanian, Bank of America today, says bye-bye, Bear. Being underinvested in stocks and cyclicals is still the key risk. What do you think? Well, that's the risk to the upside. So as an equity manager, we're always in the market, Scott. But my feeling is we're not in a bull market just yet. You've got five, six, eight, maybe nine stocks that have been leading it. But last Thursday was the first time we saw breath actually take place and, and be a sustainable difference in the trade. So we're not talking about just those handful of names. And here we are a week into it, and we haven't seen a divergence away from it. So the best thing that could happen is that we're having this conversation a few months from now. We're all giving you a yes. And the rest of the market, everything but those five, six, seven, eight stocks are catching up. But to you it. need to wait a couple of months to see if, if that broadening of the rally is legit before you're ready to suggest that the 
bulls are in charge again for the yeah. first time in quite some time? Yeah, absolutely. I think the Fed has to be done raising rates before we can be in a real sustainable moment. But don't we anticipate when they are going to be done, the, by the time you get the official all clear, the market's already moved so significantly ahead of you, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You have to be in the market before that. But Canada said they were done. Australia said they were done. Not that we follow those markets that closely. We'll probably get a pause next week. We'll get into it, I'm sure, a little bit more in detail. But I'm not sure that the Fed here is done yet. And until they are, it's going to be tough for me to validate that we're in a bull market. I mean, Steph, Barclays today says, yeah, that the technicals are a bit frothy, uh, but tentative broadening of leadership into lagging small caps in value may help sustain the breakout. I hope so. All predicated <laughs> on the fact of whether that broadening can continue. If not, you're going to be kind of in the same place that, that you've been. Right. Well, that's why we look at the economic data points and, and how that translates into earnings, right, and, and how it translates into total revenues. So the, the Atlanta Fed GDP now is at 2.2 percent for GDP for the quarter, which is stronger than what most people thought. And that's equivalent to about a 5, 6, 7 percent growth rate in total revenues for the S&P 500. People aren't expecting that. People are expecting about 2 percent. So if it's only the technology company that are keeping us afloat. That's a problem, I think. But as I said, I think the data that we're getting supports some of these other sectors and evaluations on some of these lagging sectors is really very compelling. And to the points made earlier, we are seeing a little bit of a broadening last Friday and then on Tuesday. That's all we got. The well, rest, of the, the rest of the week we had we had growth outperforming. So we had we'll a couple see. of ridiculously powerful days for the Russell 2000 that, you know, I, I, I almost say there are too strong to be believable that that it could be sustainable. We had a couple of days where the Russell was like, like, what did you say, six percent in a yeah. couple of days? Yeah, it felt like. Yeah, no, I mean, like right that now, that feel like a little exuberant. Oh, I mean, a, a little bit. But as I say, I mean, the valuations on the laggards, especially when if I feel comp confident in the earnings picture, right? If I don't feel confident in the earnings picture, then that's a problem. But I do feel confident in the financials in, the, in terms of earnings, in industrials, in earnings and in guidance from the industrials and even in energy and the free cash flow that we're seeing and the, the cash that's going to shareholders. I say, so I see value in those sectors. I'm not saying that tech is going to roll over and roll over hard. I think tech can continue to participate, but I think these others should outperform yeah, but the, going the, forward. The idea, though, Joe, that let's just say <clears throat> tech rolls over in, in, any, in any way. Do you really believe that these other parts of the market are going to pick up the slack? Given the still unknown questions about the path of the economy and what the Fed's already done, yeah, they may take June off, probably will, we think. But that doesn't mean they're fully done. No, it has to be confirmed in, in future earnings, and I think that's what's important. Uh, to Stephanie's point, month-to-date energy materials, they're both up 5 and 6 percent, respectively. Um, do, I, do I think that move has sustainability to the upside? Not without confirmation in future earnings. Um, industrials, that's the one sector where I do think there is strength. There is earning strength that, that reflects it as well. But if you see technology plateau, I'm not sure you're going to get the type of leadership from other areas of the market that will be able to carry price further higher. Kevin Simpson, in terms of sort of beaten up cyclical plays, uh, you have a new position in Coca-Cola. Uh, stock hasn't really done anything, right? So tell me the thought process about why you bought Coca-Cola here. Uh, AI, right? It's an AI play? You beat me to the punch. I, I figured they were going to say it 700 times in their <laughs> earnings call. Yeah. Uh, the stock was trading over $65 a month ago, and we had very little interest in the name. But as you get this hype and everything's going towards technologies, we, we look in the other direction. So here's a stock 10, 11 percent down from that high in 30 days. You're getting over a 3 percent dividend. They've been raising that dividend by four or five percent a year pretty consistently. Amazing free cash flow. Just a just a really well run company. The multiples on everything, I think, are still a little bit high. So we're taking a small position in it. We're getting started here. If it goes down, we'll certainly add to it. But I like the name. I like the safety trade. Yeah. Steph, you follow Coca-Cola and Pepsi. You own Pepsi, don't you? No, you used I don't to? own either. No, Coke is the one that I that I used to own, and I like it a lot. It's, Why don't you really, own it then? It's really, it's an international play, right? I mean, so you would get the juice if you do see, if we ever get China to recover. But globally, if we see better growth, 
remains to be seen, but they have about 80 percent of their revenues tied to overseas. For me, no, I, I don't own them. I, I don't own either of them. They are a little expensive, but I do own Procter & Gamble, which is also expensive. So you kind of pick your poison, right? And, and I just think that there's more operating leverage at Procter & Gamble, given the cost overhangs that they've had uh, and also the labor issues, as well as input costs being really high. I think all that's going to come down and it'll, it'll help the bottom line. So on the, on the issue of the P.E., 23 and a half as we see forward, how do you judge that? Yeah, it's too high. But I think that, that if the stock pulls down, we'll be okay, or the earnings can grow into it. We own Procter & Gamble also, so we're really trying to look at this from a bigger perspective and say, where, where can we find value? Where can we generate revenues? And, you know, for us, it's all about dividends and dividend growth. So we've got very, very high-quality names. We've still got dry powder to go into them. Procter & Gamble's a full position. Coke is a new position. I think the valuation is is going to compress, and you're seeing price bring both Coca-Cola and Pepsi down. I know Pepsi more than I know Coca-Cola. Uh, Pepsi is in the Joe T ETF. It's a name that we've owned for quite some time. And you are seeing that there finally has been a pullback in what was positive momentum. But, but overall, beverage has been strong. And if you want to extrapolate that further and look at energy drinks, you could pull up Monster Beverage, which is certainly <laughs> broken out significantly. And that's a, a consumer staple name that you could play within the sector if you don't want Coca-Cola or Pepsi. So, you know, I just want to make sure everybody's clear, too. You're a five-star fund manager. You manage the dividend income um, ETF, right, the, the Devo. Um, how are you viewing dividend strategies right now in the overall market relative to where interest rates are, where they might go from here? I just want to make sure everybody's clear with what you do for a living, um, that you are a five-star <laughs> fund manager and that you do manage a very narrow strategy of dividend and income, correct? Yeah, I do, Scott. But, you know, if you think of the dividend space, it's a hard place to be for the past year and a half to two years because when you've got tech names, megatech, AI moving the markets, everything else on the planet is pretty much just staying around the Mendoza line. So what we try to do in periods of flat markets, and but it's not that dissimilar than 2015, is we're trying to clip coupons. We're trying to generate dividends. We want dividend growth. We sprinkle in some covered call writing. But you asked a great question when you talk about it in relation to interest rates, because it was a no-brainer for 12 years. When you have zero interest rates, you can buy anything. Right, you, need to get, you need to get yield and, and income from somewhere, right? Yep. So yep. I think dividend growth really separates itself from high dividend, deep value, sometimes zombie-type stocks, where we can get a little bit of growth, strong dividends, dividend growth. And if, as long as their EBITDA, as long as their earnings go higher, you can get some appreciation as well. Is, is it hard, though, to, in some respects, sort of, you know, for lack of a better description, watch the train go by in mega cap tech when you've got the magnificent <laughs> seven, most of whom don't pay a dividend. So they're, they're not going to be a touch for you. Yeah, our Quotron doesn't get the NASDAQ. We only get a limited number of symbols. So I didn't know. Is NVIDIA up this year? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Apple pays a dividend. <laughs> we I mean, you own Apple. Yeah, we own Apple. We own Microsoft. So we get a little bit of a taste in there. We have a 5% maximum position weighting, so we can't get crazy within the space. But boy, it feels good to own Apple and own Microsoft when you see all those things happening. Does it feel like those stocks to you have more runway? Do, do they feel like they've traveled too far? Well, how do you view that? Yeah, I, I think that they're, they, they're a little ahead of their skis. I think they've come too far too fast. We've been trimming both positions. We've been writing calls against them. We're not going to sell out of them because, to Joe's point, they can grow into those multiples. We've seen it before. And any time a market gets behind a trade, if we get any type of enthusiasm, the rest of the breath of the market will pick up. But we need to bypass a recession. And if that happens and we start thinking about lower rates, I mean, the, the train's going to leave the station. Talk about um, high growth prospects, no dividend, Tesla, right? It leads me to, it's like, what are we up, 11 straight days? You had the GM announcement, obviously, with the charging stations. You had Ford before that. The stock's taking another big leap today. It's our chart of the day for obvious reasons. Uh, the other reason is that, Bill Baruch, you bought it. I did. Yeah, yeah. We it's been on my radar for a bit, and and when I look at a stock, I look at a name. I'm looking really top down, and meaning I'm looking at the fundamentals from you, a macro picture. And you, you are looking top down if you bought it up 100. <laughs> percent yeah. Well, where does is the air come? kind of thin up there? Where you're looking? Well, where's the cash coming from? We, we trimmed Microsoft and Alphabet, which were very overweight. Nvidia was our largest position for a lot of the year, so we're really just rotating here. But what I've been noticing from a macro standpoint is is copper and Tesla have really overlapped each other quite quite a bit. They track. Each other a bit, and there's a divergence recently with copper selling off. And copper is, it gives you a really good feeling on what's going on in China. 
And it, because 20 percent, more than just more than 20 percent of Tesla's revenues come from China. Elon Musk, by the way, was over in Asia making a, a, a trip. So I think there was some some good momentum coming out of that. Um, but on top of that, one of our theories was was some of the tech is going to lead us out of the hole. And once AI really starts generating the momentum, I think Tesla is going to be in a really great uh, place to capitalize on that. So those are the bigger, broader themes that, that brought me to this shift. But then I'm a, I am now, I've been listening to Kathy Wood talk a bit and uh, more and more, and I'm a believer in a lot of what she's saying and how it's software, and now we're seeing with the charging stations, the ecosystem that Tesla has built is, is unmatched. And then there, to finish it off, there's a massive technical breakout, downtrend line, getting above a 382 retracement, and there's some momentum behind that. So, so we moved Tesla, we bought it on Wednesday initially, opened a position the first time we've owned it in, in, in portfolios, added again to yesterday, it's now a top 10 position. How do you get around 71 times earnings and 45 times EV, EV to EBITDA. I, I don't I don't argue with that, but where's our cash coming from that's going to fund this position? And that's coming from names that we've trimmed that are up quite a bit this year, like a Microsoft right. and Alphabet and NVIDIA. I mean, I think in fairness, too, though, step to your question, I mean, if you, you're never going to buy Tesla and say valuations, well, great. I'm trying to get my hands around it. I mean, yeah. is it well, some of the Well, I am, to too. I am, too, for somebody who sold NVIDIA because of the incredible run and, you know. It became too big on our portfolio, NVIDIA, ultimately. Nice yeah, call. I know, but that cannot be the only reason that you got rid of it. I'm not going to let you slide that easily. No way. No way. Do, well, you didn't have a problem with the, the valuation of NVIDIA at all? You know, the, it's something we're aware of. Um, we're just over 20% in semiconductors in, in general. So, so AMD, NVIDIA, uh, we do have exposure in Micron's one of our top positions, which hasn't done so well, uh, Broadcom, and, and as well, uh, Marvell. So we own, we own those names, and we just trimmed off some of that, some of that move. But it's a continued a matter of rotation. Who's going to be the next leader in this market? And, and technically, uh, you also have Tesla. That's it's more of this consumer name. Amazon's a consumer name. Um, we don't have any exposure in consumer names other than Amazon. And those and are the now. only two ones you want. I mean, look, there's a reason why discretionary is, I think, still the third best sector on the year behind tech and comm services. It's because of Tesla, yeah. as, as, we, as we just said. And Amazon. And Amazon. Tes Tesla and Amazon. And and in the case, everything else is like so spotty. Like, what are you what are you going to bet on there? Home builders, you know, you could buy some yeah, home so builders. The home builders too. Yeah, right. Right. Fair point. Home and and I'm not just well. some. I'm not just a growth manager. I'm, I'm a manager looking for alpha in the market. And right now, what I'm seeing, what our theme was this year, was bring out your 2019 playbook. Even in May, we, we put a note out to clients: buy in May. This bull market is here to stay. We've been bullish, and so we're going to continue to play that theme. I have some levels that if Tesla were to reverse, we would we would manage and cut out of that position the same way, Joe. You you you, you talk about moving. And, and yep. names and when they manage that risk. So I'm right now, this is a very tactical position. Um, I'm going to raise some additional cash in the portfolio from other parts of it. But uh, yeah, I like it right now. There, there is a little bit of a fundamental catalyst, though, to the move in Tesla today, because it is significant that both GM and Ford have now validated that Tesla is the premier charging station, and, and it really eliminates any competition. Yeah. So the CCS, you could now put that to the sidelines. Um, the interesting thing about Tesla and the way that it trades when you study its price action and the, the quantitative nature of it is it trades with the highest correlation of S&P 500 stocks to commodities. It actually yes. trades like a commodity that's with right. that boom bust cycle. And I think that's important for the viewers to understand that if you're getting into this name, you have to size the position accordingly because there's going to be extreme volatility in this name that has proven itself over the last several years. I don't think that's going anywhere. And that's where I started the conversation talking about copper. I'm watching copper. I think copper came, is coming out of the hole and they, they, dis, they discorrelated recently. I think that, that comes back into fact and that could be a tailwind for Tesla at this point, but but like you said, the charging station. This this is everything coming to fruition that they have planned for. Then their manufacturing costs are going to start going lower. Their car prices are going to start going lower. It, it's I mean it's just really a terrific space right now. Why isn't Tesla in the Joe T? Didn't have the momentum. Yeah, it had a yellow light. The green light was not turned on. Um, you're well aware of the significant moves that you know. It's quite. We're six weeks away from what we did at the end of April. And quite candidly, it's all rules-based. It's removing the emotion. And I don't know if instinctively, if I was just relying on pure Joe emotion and, and, and uh, instinct, oh, if I, I would have made the oh, same, I if I would have made the same moves 
that that strategy and the rules dictated that we made. Going back into NVIDIA, going back into Apple and Microsoft, making those types of moves, um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to use the word courageous, but those were difficult decisions to make. And thankfully, the emotion was removed because it's rules based, and that's where the quantitative. But how doesn't the rule? How doesn't around. the rule base around? How's the momentum gone in a name that's up forty six percent in a month since since then? That, uh, there was obvious momentum there. No. Um, so Tesla from its November high is down it's still down about 20, 20. It's down 22% from its 52-week high. It's, it's down, down 20%. okay, but from its November high, it's down well over 40%, actually. So we're studying momentum on short and longer time frames. It's still down significantly. And at the end of April, you did not have the type of appreciation that we had. So at the end of July, we'll take a look at it. We'll see if a yellow light turns to green. Does valuation play a role in how you choose stocks to go into your, your ETF? It, it, it does from the perspective of is the earnings growth sustainable over a 36-month period? And what is the trend in earnings and revenue growth over a 36-month period? Because Tesla's never been in the JOT, right? Tesla was in the JOT previously. When did you take it out? It was liquidated along with other mega caps when we had the tax loss harvesting. Oh, okay. So I, I, I really want to understand this. So mm -hmm. you removed it with the mega caps when you did. Correct. When you added the mega caps back in, this was one that didn't go back in. Correct. Um, Amazon, Alphabet, Tesla, they all had what we would term yellow lights. I got you. Is there a green light for you on that or no? Does it pay would, it, would it ever be? You own anything just personally that you don't manage? You, <laughs> no, no you everything wanna, has to. You don't own anything that doesn't pay a dividend. I wouldn't. Inv I mean, if I was an investor in my strategy, I would want to make sure that I eat my own cooking. So. Oh, I understand that, but you might have a little play around fund too. <laughs> no, because then I get emotional like Joe, and I buy stocks on the way up, and I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that I keep the emotion out of it. So, Steph, you mentioned. I think you said financials. You think they're cheap. You think they have good earnings power. Bill, you bought Bank of America. Yes. Last week. Yes. Brian Moynihan, by the way, is going to be on the exchange on Monday. It's an exclusive, 1 p.m. You don't want to miss that. At any rate. Go ahead. Well, you know, I will admit, I mean, I've, I've, we've, told, we've highlighted a lot of my great trades in the past two weeks, three weeks. But, you know, Bank of America was a bad trade for me. I, I bought this at the end of February. We had, really didn't have enough banking exposure. And then I sold it, you know, kind of quickly in, in March. I wanted to get back into this. And, and we don't have any bank exposure other than Morgan Stanley. I, so I bought a Tesla, but I also added a Bank of America. So I'm kind of evening things out. I, I do think that, that we're going to see the economy continue to have the soft landing or no landing for a bit. And I like where the banks are with these rates. And I think the curve itself, you know, people are talking about a, a, the continuing to invert, continue to flatten. But I think we'll find a, find some some momentum behind that. Steph, what do you think of this? I mean, it's less than nine times earnings. Nine times earnings, point nine times book, gives you a three percent yield. It's very cheap. Um, it's been cheap for a while, but all the financials are cheap. And it's because of the yield curve, right? I mean, they're going to fight to go to have net interest income down 2%. That's going to be a victory for them sequentially. Yeah, yeah. And that's tough. Now, on the opposite side, heavy investments in technology. So there's that. Trading actually is better than expected. And I do think we have seen the market participation, which will help capital markets as well. Yes. Uh, I also own Morgan Stanley as well. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's cheap. I just don't know what the catalyst is given the yield curve. But I'm willing to be, be, be patient. What about the financials? I own J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. I think all the financials are going to be under a little bit of pressure because of the regulatory changes that we know are coming. It's going to affect profitability. So I like Bank of America because it has the investment side. I like the Morgan Stanley trade because of the investment side. We happen to own J.P. Morgan and Goldman, but I can see the validation of both of those. Okay. 